Hi all, this is Leilani speaking. Uh, for those of you who may not have seen me yet today, white skin, long dark hair, big red glasses, bright red lips, dark shiny nails. You'll probably see the nails and hands as much as the rest of the face because I gesticulate when I talk. Uh, I am just sort of welcoming folks into the space as we head into one of our last two performances of the convening with Theater Kapow. We have three members of the ensemble present with us, and um, there's going to be very little facilitation for me, at least to get us started. So again, just letting folks come into the space. Thank you to those of you. I'm seeing a few folks who have been with us for all or most of the day. Thank you for your participation and presence and attention. And I'm really excited to see to share this piece and conversation with you. Can I share the video now? <laughs> Yeah. Hi, everybody. Just welcome, <laughs> welcome. And yes, by all means, Derek, please press play. Oh, Matthew, yes. Hold on. Yeah. Yeah, um, you want sorry. to set context. <laughs> we were going to set a little bit of context. But <clears throat> first off, uh, my name is Matt Cahoon. I'm the artistic director of Theater Kapow. I'm a white man with no hair. Um, uh, because of my advanced age, my glasses will go on and off throughout the conversation. <clears throat> Wearing a blue shirt today with a silver tie. Um, thank you all for joining us. The um, the piece we're going to look at today is called The Boy, that was a play that was commissioned by Theodore Kapow and written by a playwright named A.J. Diddy. Um, the piece was actually commissioned pre-pandemic. Um, Carrie uh, had an idea for Theodore Kapow to do something with Ibsen's play Pierre Gint. We didn't exactly know what to do with it, um, and we looked at several editions of the play of Pierre Gint, and one of them was the 1963 Archer edition, which contained illustrations by um, an illustrator named Pierre Krogh. And when we read about Pierre Krogh, it turns out that he was imprisoned in the, Gris in the Grinny prison camp in Norway during World War II. Um, Norway, many people don't think about um, kind of the Nazi occupation of Norway, but um, the Nazis, the Germans were occupying occupying Norway from 1940 to 1944. And while imprisoned at Grinney, um, Peer Krogh <clears throat> spent his time covering the walls of his cell with um, images from <clears throat> Norwegian folklore, primarily from uh, Ibsen's Peer Gint. And so after the war, the um, they actually Krog and his publisher went back to Grinny and transcribed the images from the wall onto paper, and then those images became the illustrations for the 1963 Archer edition of the play. Um, we found that as interesting as Pierre Gint was as a play, the story of Pierre Krog actually was a more relevant and um, richer space, perhaps for exploration in creating our own piece. Um, and so what you're gonna see today is three scenes from the Boig um, featuring these two actresses here with us today um, and, and a few others, um, <clears throat> notably, and I think important in terms of the context, um, the playwright specified that all of the prisoners be played by, um, by female identifying performers and that the Nazis be played by male identifying performers. So you're gonna see um, Odd Nansen and Pierre Krogh and Robert Reifling um, uh, as characters who were who were real life men uh, performed by, by women. And I just wanted to give that contextual um, baseline so that it, it made a little bit more sense as you watched it, since you're watching it a little bit out of context. But we are ready now, Derek, to watch three scenes from the Boyg. Good afternoon. Before we begin today's presentation, we would like to offer this land acknowledgement. For Theater Kapow in our studio space, and for me today, this sharing takes place on Endakana, the traditional ancestral homelands of the Abenaki, Wabanaki, and Penacook peoples past 
and present. We do this to honor the land and waterways and the Albanak who have stewarded Indakana throughout the generations. This moment calls us to commit to continuing to learn how to be better stewards of the land we inhabit. We do this to pay respect to the Abenaki, Wabanaki, and Penacook peoples and their elders, past, present, and emerging. We hope to inspire greater curiosity among non-native peoples about the land on which they live, to halt the erasure of indigenous history, and to encourage the support of indigenous communities, both locally and globally. We invite and encourage you to learn more about the indigenous communities where you live and work. Thank you. We could use puppets! Right? We're already forced to be making those awful jumping jacks. We could put that wood to good use. The, the scene is about Gint giving one last story to his dying mother. It doesn't need puppets. Mikhail is an excellent woodcarver. Isn't that right, Mikhail? I mostly carved tables. I'd imagine it's the same concept, but with eyes. You hear that, Odd? It's like a table with eyes. <laughs> Come on, let's just try it. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but at least we'll know. Mikhail? Yes, sir? Do you think you could carve us a puppet? I can try. All right, we'll give it a try. Also, I don't want to play Asa. What? Why? I am a bad actor, Francis. It's all right. We all have our strengths, and mine is clearly staying as far away from the stage as humanly possible. <laughs> then who, may I ask, is going to play Pierre Gint's mother, huh? Robert? Oh, no, I get terrible stage fright. Robert, you are a musician. I know, it's a real problem. Well, there is no one else. I'll do it. Literally, no one else. You boy, get up here. Uh, I'll feed you the lines. Don't bother. I've been listening all night. I'm like a bear trap. I'll just go fuck myself. That then. would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Me in the eyes, boy. No, don't look at them. They're not here. Just you and me. Now, you got a mother? I did. Is she dead? Yes. Did you get on with her? Yes. Did you love her? I did. You there when she died? Yes. What was it like? The room. Put yourself there. Well, it was cold, damp. She was coughing. And what did it smell like? Mildew and rot. Good. Good. Smell that air. Now. Why, Peter, what ringing do I hear? That's just the sleigh bells, nothing more. Oh, I don't like them, Peter. They sound empty somehow. Hollow. Watch out, we're going over a fjord. Oh, I don't like, I don't like, it's too much, Peter. I'm scared. Oh, what is that roaring? Just the wind through the trees, nothing to be scared of. What is that like there, Peter? The kind that pierces through the dark? It's from the manor on the hill. Do you hear the music? They must be dancing. Isn't that nice? It is. It is nice. Hey! Hey, everyone! You idiots trying to get through Heaven's Gate! Don't you know who we are? We're Pierre Gint and company, and we want inside. What do you say, St. Petey? You want to open the gate? My mom's the real deal. 
genuine and kind to the bone. And I, I am not. But I'm not staying long, unless you want to pour me a drink. No, no, of course, another time, another time. I wasn't, I wasn't good to my mom. Um, she'll be the first to tell you. I'm sure you'll hear all about it once we get her inside, because there's no one more deserving of heaven, of some, of some relief than my mom. She suffered her whole life. And she, she deserves some peace. And St. Petey, he'll say, Jesus Christ, let her in. And then you'll get to go dancing and warm yourself by the fire and Yeah, that's it. That's the play. Is it all right? Normally they give us scraps, kindling, most of it, but for the commandant's jumping jack, they tried to get us the best stuff they could. It's good, right? Uh, I really don't work in wood too much. It will do. Oh, good. Well, I uh, did a sketch of uh, what the puppet should look like. It's a fantasy version of Gint, so it can be a bit over the top. You know, a uh, big grin, big muscles. I guess, however you imagine yourself, when you see yourself in dreams, is probably a good way to go. I understand. Great. Well, I suppose I'll let you get to it. Dancer thinks it's just me in here being a toy maker, so try not to make too much noise. Can I ask you something? Of course. That painting on the wall of the barrack, what was it? It's of Pier Gint fighting the boy. Traditionally, it's a snake monster that keeps travelers from where they're going, mostly by eating them. Your painting didn't look like a serpent to me. Well, Ibsen portrays it as this great, unknowable nothingness. A diversion on the path to, I don't know, self-actualization. We never actually see it in the play. I liked it. Your painting. Thank you. Odd said you hadn't painted in a long time. No, not since, uh, not since Vital, actually. That's the work camp in the north, correct? I've talked to some of the prisoners who were transferred from there. It sounds terrible. It wasn't my favorite thing, no. What happened to you up there? Your father was a woodcarver. What about your mother? You haven't really talked about her. What was she like? She was a school teacher. She died right before I came here. I'm so sorry. I was out drinking. We had gotten in a fight. She found out I had thrown stones at some Nazis on the street and was furious with me. How could I endanger myself like that? I could have been killed. How did I not understand that? I didn't understand how she could just sit there and do nothing. So, I was mad and I went drinking. I didn't think she'd come looking for me. Winters aren't particularly kind to those who don't prepare for them. She got sick. She was dead a few days later. It's terrible. 
in my grief, I may or may not have thrown a larger stone at a more important Nazi. This time I hit home. And now, I'm here. Thought you said you were here because you destroyed an entire civilization. Well, that too. <laughs> but, uh, hitting that German bastard was the last straw, I suppose. This one. Why that one? Certain wood contains certain properties. Birch feels different than oak. It um, emanates an energy. My father carved most of our furniture out of birch. Our dining room table, he carved little trolls in the legs, taught me to believe in the magic of the forest. That dining room table felt like home. I like working in birch. You said there was magic in the forest? Yes. And what kind of magic? Trolls, magic folk, a whole kingdom beneath the ground. You talk like you've seen it. Of course I have. Okay. You don't believe me? Well, no. <laughs> but you're Norwegian. I thought all Norwegians believed in the magic of the forest. I grew up in Paris, mostly. Not a lot of room for superstition in the French art scene. Well, not a lot of Norwegian superstition, anyway. Suit yourself. Oh, go on, then. <laughs> no, no. You said you weren't a believer, so... Well, make me one, then. What was it like? The mountain is dark and deep. There are stone fountains, but no water runs through them. They look like ruins. Everything is carved out of the rock wall. The trolls were nice, kind. There had recently been a coup. The troll king had been overthrown. It's a republic now. Every troll has an equal say. They thought a discussion could rebuild them from the ashes. They were wrong. Because there is a feature down in the depths. Nobody's ever seen it, but its presence is familiar. Like something creeping in the corner of your vision. But when you turn to look, it's a there. They had no name for it. No troll had ever ventured down into its lair and returned to tell of it. But they knew it was there, waiting. They sealed it away, locked it up beneath their city. It inspires madness in all who look upon it. Trolls were disappearing by the day. They needed help. They asked me, begged me, would I face it? Would I fight it the way the other one had long ago? What choice did I have? I made my way down a long, spiraling staircase, torch in hand. It seemed to descend forever. I had walked so far down that when I looked up, the light was almost completely gone. The air became cold. Damp, with a taste like mildew and rot. I began to think that there was no end, <sighs> that I would be descending forever until I dropped dead from old age. And that's when I heard it, breathing. It was soft, just at the edge of my hearing, but I could hear it in and out. The smacking of wet jaws, the grinding of teeth. I continued down and down until I was surrounded by darkness. How is he? He's all right. He's had stomach ulcers for years. I guess one or two of them must have burst. I see. He's in good spirits, though. The others stayed behind to keep him company. But you came back? I don't like the infirmary. It's too... Feels too close to the outside world. 
makes me think we're closer than we are, and hope is the first thing to get you in here. Too much of it becomes toxic. So thank you for that, I guess. I didn't mean to send your friend to the infirmary. But you stand by what you said. I do. So you think I'm a coward? I didn't say that. No, you think it, though. I think you're not being honest with yourself. Oh, really? And you're certainly not being honest with me. <gasps> That's rich, coming from the king of the fucking trolls. What happened? At Vital. Believe me or don't, but I have been nothing but honest with you. Oh, yeah, sure. Pretending you weren't Jewish was real honest. That was a matter of safety. You know, they were trying to protect you. Francis, odd. They put it out to the camp. The boy can't know about the order. I'm not a boy. I'm so sick of you all patronizing me. I can take care of myself. But like all those men in barrack six. When are you going to wake up and realize you are a sheep? Surrounded by starving wolves. What is it going to take to scare you? I used to be scared. I used to be terrified all the time. But now, now I'm just angry. And if they try to take me, I'll fight. I'll fight to my very last breath. And if I die, I'll have died taking a Nazi with yeah, me. But you'd still be dead. Some things are worth dying for. Maybe some of us don't want you to die. Mikhail, maybe I don't want you to die. Why? Because I'm your friend. Prove it. What happened at Vital? It doesn't matter. Why did you stop painting? Because I couldn't think of anything to paint start again? Because of you! I don't know what it was, but I looked at you and I felt like myself. For the first time in a long time, I felt like myself again. All that time up there in the north, I felt so alone. Having Odd helped in the beginning, but the superintendent, he, he took a liking to me. He heard who my father was, heard I had studied with Matisse, and he started isolating me. Pulling me out of the work lineup, making me paint for him. The wind up there strikes through your heart and freezes it. It's amazing how quickly you go numb. It was okay at first. I was getting to paint. While my fellow prisoners froze out in the snow, building a bridge to nowhere. But everything I made was his. He acted as if he owned me. And I'm not sure he was wrong. I started to feel like a ghost, like... Like I was disappearing from my own life, like all my friends and loved ones had forgotten me, like... Like I had never really existed at all. There was a fjord about a 30-minute walk from camp. It was the only place we could do all our washing. It was always a nightmare to get to walking that far in the snow. You don't realize how exhausted you are until it's too late. And one day, I was standing at the edge of the river watching the water rushing by me. And I thought about the walk back. And I thought about the work. And I thought about the cold in my shoes. And a voice at the back of my mind said, wouldn't it just be easier? Wouldn't it just be easier? to fall in. The guards thought it was an accident, thought I'd slipped on the edge of the bank and tumbled in. But Odd knew. I knew he knew. I could see it in his eyes, the look he gave me. 
if all I was good for was making art for monsters, what was the point of me? What's the point of me? <laughs> First thing I'm going to do when I get out of here, I'm going to make a whole army of marionettes. What? No, I will. I'll make a whole army of marionettes, and then you all can put on a five and a half hour production of Pierre Gint using nothing but puppets. That sounds awful. It really does. <laughs> I was just trying to do something you liked. I see. And what will you do when you get out? Sleep past six in the morning for a start. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. Eat some food with some fucking flavor. Oh, magnificent. And paint. Oh, I fill my whole studio with paintings. Oh, to have access to a palette again. You'd paint me? If you'd like. I would. What will you really do when you get out? Go traveling. Mm. See the world. I'd love to go to Morocco. I've heard marvelous things. Egypt. I don't think I'd ever want to see Norway again. I wouldn't blame you. Don't give up. Here. Got a lot to fight for. So fight. Thank you. So that's a little taste of um of the Boyg by A.J. Diddy. Um, uh, I realized a couple of little things of context I probably should have added. One, one fairly significant one is um, that A.J.'s primary source for the writing actually came from a, concentra a concentration camp memoir by Odd Nansen, which is the character that Carrie played in the, in the piece. He actually, um, it ends up being a very long book. Um, he uh, wrote uh, journal entries over the course of his stay in Grinney, um, and he shared a, um, a cell. They were in Barrack 12 uh, with uh, Pierre Krogh. And we end up, most really a, a, that we know about Pierre Krogh comes through that memoir that Odd Nansen wrote, so much so that when I wrote to the museum, um, there is a museum there at Grinney. And when I wrote to them and asked about Pierre Krogh, all they could really tell me was where he stayed and his prisoner number. And they had a painting, um, they had a painting that featured him, uh, Francis Bull and Odd Nansen sitting and playing cards together. Um, they didn't really know anything beyond that about Pierre Krogh. Um, and so uh, a lot, uh, AJ had to do a lot of work in terms of doing the research. And then, of course, these actors had to do a lot of work in terms of, um, you know, not only preparing their roles as they sat on the scripted page, but also finding out as much as they could kind of about the real people that they were portraying. So um, rather than listening to me, I'd love to have Rachel and Carrie talk. Um, Rachel, I was gonna, as you know, I was gonna ask you to talk a little bit about the development process as we moved from, you know, de developing, commissioning and developing a play during um, COVID is very difficult. So maybe you can talk a little bit about 
um, the process of how we went through readings and then how eventually we got into rehearsal and to performance. Sure. Um, my name is Rachel Longo. Um, I'm coming to you from Andover, Massachusetts, and I have blonde hair. I am white and I'm wearing a green uh, sweater. Um, so this was a long process. Um, it actually began uh, even earlier with just the discussions with uh, Matt and Carrie having discussions around creating a piece, perhaps a devised piece around um, Pierre Gint. And then we did some workshop exploration with the um, paintings of Pierre Krogh as that became an idea. And then some time went by and then um, AJ was commissioned to write an actual script that we would use for the project. Um, so that was, you know, over the course of a few years. And then um, we had, I believe we had scheduled the production to go up uh, fall 2000. June, June 2020. June 2020. Yeah. Thank you. June 2020. That did not happen. Um, but it did give us some time to do some uh, Zoom readings with um, the cast. And it ended up being pretty much, um, if I'm not mistaken, completely the same cast that we ended up almost uh, the same cast that we went into production with, which was really valuable because rather than this kind of um, quicker process that a lot of our projects would be. Um, it gave us time to read drafts of the scripts, uh, script and then get new ones from AJ and read them through a couple of times on Zoom and have um, some feedback and some discussions among the production team. Um, Here's some ideas about design and lighting and set. Um, and that really, that process, being able to do that together and have it marinate and spend time with the script and take the time to do the research and get to know our characters. Um, when we came into a pretty um, quick, abbreviated, intensive process uh, in person rehearsals, when we did end up coming back together to put it up um, at Pinkerton Academy, we we had sort of established a language around the play. We had established an understanding of the history and the coming together of these two um, to, you know, this character and this historic figure and um, we're able to also really work in the space and on the set for the majority of our few weeks of rehearsal. We had um, an intensive rehearsal process and that's sort of an actor's dream in terms of the repetition of that. Um, repetition is sort of our best friend when it's frequent um, and it was intensive and we were able to really explore the set from the beginning, um, even costumes were ready. And so we were really able to get to know sort of the physicality. We were able to explore the space and uh, uh, the opportunities that are presented to us. Um, it was sort of a physical, physically demanding show because we did, um, <laughs> at least I did climb um, bunk beds a lot. Um, and that was uh, something you had to explore and get used to. And, and uh, there were some safety things with the tables and standing on them. And, but just it just felt like, you know, the seamless direction of the transitions by Matt made it just sort of feel like a dance, honestly, um, like a choreographed piece of movement that was always flowing. Um, and it was uh, a really, um, it was really fun to explore what we could do with the set sounds we could create with the slamming doors. You saw that in one of the clips uh, just now. Um, and the importance of the objects that they did have because there were only so, there were so few of those. Um, so I would say that in the end, sort of that extended process really was very valuable to get to know the piece, to get to know the team. Um, and it became a really intimate experience um, that was really, really wonderful. Yeah, and one thing um, Rachel touched upon, uh, we had designers in the room from day one, literally our scenic designer, our lighting designer, and Carrie did the costumes were all there as part of the process from our very first rehearsal, or from our very first draft reading. Um, and Rachel touched upon a, a couple things, um, Carrie, that I'm going to kind of ask you about. Um, we did have the set. Um, pretty early on in the rehearsal process. We also had the costumes. Um, 
you as the the actress playing Odd Nansen also took the time to read From Day to Day, which is Odd's uh, memoir. Um, could you talk a little bit about, um, you know, the importance of period accuracy in a contemporary play that's really kind of historic fiction and how do we marry those worlds together? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Carrie. Um, I am a white woman with blonde hair wearing a it looks black on screen shirt and an oatmeal colored sweater. Um, and I am in New Hampton, New Hampshire. Um, one of the um, delightful things about um, this particular project was, um, was just that digging into like historical accuracies, but what were the things that we wanted to point to when we did that? Because of course, all of the male characters, all of the prisoners are played by women. So even though we're striving for historical accuracy, we've also kind of broken that a little bit. So we had to be very intentional about what things did we want to keep um, in period. And I will, I will point to our amazing scenic designer who is not here with us today, but he is in spirit with us, um, Dan Daly, who really did a lot of research. And if you look at some pictures from the Grinney Museum, um, the, the bunks, the, the room, the barrack is really exactly um, as it would have been, the small cubby where they could store what few either, they weren't really their own possessions. They were, you know, they're assigned mug and they're assigned set of silverware, um, you know, but other things that they, you know, if they had, some cigarettes. Cigarettes uh, become currency um, in the barrack as they um, still remain uh, currency in in some places. Um, and you know, so they could they could hide their stuff away, and it was really their space and their bunk. You know, each prisoner's bunk was really their space, um, and having time to make that space our space um, was really great. But Dan was um, Dan was really amazing um, about making making things historically accurate when they needed to be, but also making them theatrical when they needed to be to break apart um, or to send focus in a particular way. Uh, one of the things that was very interesting about this play and this process and that I did take a lot in um, reading, Nansen's diary entries, which is essentially what they are um, from his time in the prison, um, are this notion of how do I retain myself? How do I retain myself under extraordinarily difficult circumstances? And the not so funny thing is that, of course, for all of us, the, the process of the creation of this play um, no, was not happening under circumstances nearly as difficult, right? Let's, let's take that context. But the reality of what does my art mean? What does my art mean now? If my art, you know, the art of theater, right? Reaching out to communicate with others. Um, I'll hearken back to something Shoshana referenced in talking about Sandglass's work, that here we are, during this pandemic and we are we have no choice but to breathe one another's air and that you know we're in the middle of a phase in creating this work when breathing uh, someone else's air is is terrifying um and you know what what do we as theater artists what you know what is what was that moment two years ago what is this moment now you know, how, how can we still reach out and connect and find value in our work, which is really ultimately what this play is about, that, you know, art as, art as, art as weapon. I mean, art certainly has been weaponized um, in many places, but art as salvation for both the artist and the receiver of that. So that was a, that started out as a really small thing and kind of morphed into a really kind of big existential philosophical thing about who we all are and what we do. Um, but I think it's important and, you know, in, in rewatching 
this just now, I was reminded of that, um, that so much of this process, this project started out as, as one thing and became something else entirely. And so much of that was because of what we found as we were digging, but also what we were experiencing and what AJ, our writer, was experiencing in this time. You know, how do I, how do I create my art in this, in this world that I'm in now? Um, and I think that's a, it's a beautiful thing and a hard thing. I don't know the answer. How do we create our art in yeah. this world? <laughs> so I think one thing that that we as a company constantly ask ourselves, and I'm sure all the artists out there ask yourselves when you're doing work is why this show and why now? And I think Carrie just touched up upon a lot of that. Um, and it's really fascinating to me what you just said, Carrie, about the why changing over the course of the process. I hadn't really thought about that, but it certainly, it certainly did. Um, the the Boig, um, for for a little bit of background on that, um, the title, it's talked about in that in that video clip, but it goes by pretty quickly. So. Um, the Boig is a is our Norwegian monster in folklore, which. Um, it depends on how it's depicted. It's often depicted with like, um, as kind of like a dragony type uh, monster, but Ibsen reimagines it as darkness and emptiness. Um, and and obviously for Krog, uh, maybe not obviously, but probably for Krog as somebody imprisoned, um, that uh, that feeling of darkness and emptiness was very present in his life. Um, and so he clearly, um, I wish I had brought a picture, but he, his depiction of the Boig is amazing. It's a man looking into a black swirly abyss. Um, and that, that image made it into the, into the play. Um, but I think most importantly, um, to AJ, not to speak for him, but, um, AJ is somebody who, um, who suffers from depression, um, and it became uh, really important to him to try to explain what that feels like to people who maybe have never experienced it. And so there are these long um, sections of the play where um, where Pierre Krog has conversations with one of the Nazi officers, um, and the Nazi officer will say things like, "You know, why do you feel so sad? Just get over it. Get better. Feel better." You know, people need to see you doing your work and being happy. And it was towards the very end of the process that AJ told me that those those sections of the play were conversations he had had with one of his bosses while he was working on a play on a show. And his boss would just say, AJ, you need to do better. You need to make people happy. They're here to be happy. And his own depression, um, his own feelings of um, suicidal ideation, um, entered the play in a really um, personal but really affecting way. And I think um, I think that in a way also redefined why this play, why now? Um, yeah, and so Rachel, I know that um, one of the things that you and I have talked a lot about is kind of creating, creating moments on stage. As you look back at your experience in the Boig and all these fine people didn't necessarily see this, but what are some moments that kind of resonate with you still today? And Kara, you can answer this question too. What are some moments that you're really proud of, those moments that you found of expressive theatrical poetry that we were able to create together as a company? I'm gonna jump in before Rachel has had a chance to answer, just naming the requests that you all wanted time to engage with the audience. And we are just under 10. So I am sure I speak for everyone when I say, I very much would love to hear the answers about that resonance from each of you. Um, and as folks are answering, if you have questions, just to keep us tight on time, feel free to put them in the chat so that I can elevate them to Matt, Carrie, and Rachel once uh, Rachel and Carrie have shared these thoughts. Um, thank you. Thank yes, you. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I, there's so many. Um, <laughs> it really was like a, a joyful experience of theatrical moments. Um, and it was possible because of the incredible um, team. But um, there's, 
There actually one of them is is um, the moment where we're all sitting together and this was a clip that we showed of of the um of us sitting down listening to the story uh the run through of the play and just having the um, the ability to sit and witness that um and then how it we're sort of immersed in that world of watching them do the reading of the play and then it breaks when um Francis says yeah yeah that's that's the play um and just there were so many moments where we could sort of seamlessly shift into this sort of dreamlike state um there's so much magic in this play um and you could sort of feel it around you um performing it and um I think one other that really sort of resonates with me um so many uh there's a moment where I was we were shifting the um, banner um, and we had, I had to stand on top of the, um, the bunk bed and just being the perspective of being that high above that set was really quite extraordinary, honestly, to be up above um, and then see the audience and see the team below me. It was really amazing. And one other um, that was really striking was when we, um, would line up for roll call. There was just a quick moment in the play where we were called for roll call and we would step forward and we were really close to the audience. Um, and it's hard to describe how it felt, but um, it's so it was so dehumanizing, um, that section of the play and um, and the expectation to be prepared for that and standing in the freezing cold to step forward and ensure that you were there on time, ready to go. Um, so those are some moments, those images stand out to me. One of the things that I really enjoyed getting the opportunity to watch um, both in rehearsal and then on stage, um, I, I watched it happen. I was on the periphery for this whole scene um, was the way that we handled stage violence. Um, there's a there's a pretty dramatic, horrible beating that that happens in the script. Um, the officers beat Per Krog. Um, and we worked with an amazing choreographer. Um, and we actually did that as a there was no contact during that beating. And it was it was uh, in many ways worse um, because the actress playing Per Krog, kind of, I mean, she didn't do it all. The actor playing the officer, you know, did some too, but but it was really, it was created and it, it reminded me of that what the audience is filling in, in their head is often so much more powerful than what we can actually create. So I think it was a, that was a great moment of, um, inviting the audience in to look at something that they probably don't want to look at and to help um and to help create something that they don't really actually maybe probably hopefully that they don't really want to create but there's a there's a drawing in there that happens and so that moment every night um and like i said in the process what you know watching that be created and then watching it um happen every night um was very effective and something that i will not long Will, will not forget and that I, I take a lot from that. How do we invite people in to look at things that they don't really want to look at and then and then what? Talk about it, maybe, why, where it came from. Um, that's my answer. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for reminding me that we should we should shout out Lorraine Chapman, um, who's an amazing choreographer local to Boston. Uh, Lorraine Chapman, the company is her company, and um, uh, Lorraine has worked with Theater Kapow now on a couple of um, projects, but if you are a theater maker in the area who wants somebody who really speaks theater as a choreographer, uh, Lorraine is incredible to work with, um, and not somebody who would typically be somebody you bring in to stage violence on stage, but the violence that she staged was um, breathtaking. Um, and uh, and yes, Claudia says in the chat that she liked the set and Carrie did mention Dan Daly, um, an incredible designer, currently um, a professor in residence at um, Skidmore. 
and um, great, great artist. Um, Jake Hudgens was our composer um, who did some of the craziest stuff I've ever seen. Um, he played, for most of the sounds in the show, he played a timpani by bow stringing it with, um, with like a violin bow. Um, and it was a weird, crazy sound, um, but also kind of spoke to what was going on in Pierre's head. Um, so there were so many, um, we, it was a really very fortunate convening of, of really high level artists. Um, I think in part because of the pandemic, there was a lot of interest in being super creative again. And so the team, um, not only were we comfortable with each other, um, but they were just like, everyone was so desperate to make work. Um, and I think that that really ended up benefiting the, the show tremendously. Um, any questions out there? Um, and folks, you can also use voice chat as well. You don't need me to read for you if that's more comfortable. Thank you as folks um, formulate any questions they might have. I just wanted to thank Matt Carey and Rachel for bringing your collaborators into the space. Um, and Matt, if there is an image that you had wanted to share, you can continue to update the performance portion on Whova. So this is a moment where I am going to uh, sort of plug that to our participants that you can continue to engage there and engage with each other. Um, I, as we're waiting, if there's any questions from the uh, sort of attendees, I would be happy to just ask about the um, motivation behind the gendered choices. Uh, I, that, that jumped out and I was just really interested in, that's a really strong choice to set a specific binary and to have that binary not necessarily align with the historical gender identities of the people you're portraying. Agreed. Um, and I can only speak to um, I can only speak to what I understand of AJ's um, intentions there, but um, I and I'll try to speak to it a little bit without without trying to speak for him. But much of what his thought process was was that the arts um, the arts were treated as um, as female pursuit in many ways. Um, and he was looking at these Nazi oppressors as somewhat, um, de obviously, somewhat dehumanizing their, their prisoners, um, making them less than themselves. Um, he's, I think, clearly, I know this is me more as the English major than as, than as the person who directed the show, but I think AJ is clearly making... Um, um some statements about the patriarchy and about um you know the kind of toxic masculinity of men in charge um and i i think um uh, without first off i decided today very purposely not to um to share any scenes with the nazis because it just like i just didn't need to give them any screen time um but um but i also think Without that context, it's hard to understand how that dynamic worked. Um, but it was, um, yeah, I don't know, Carrie, do you want to speak a little bit to the way that felt to you as a theater artist or, or your- I okay. think that one of the things that becomes so important is that there is an othering that, that happens because the Nazi officers are male and the prisoners are all female presenting. Um, and and I think that um, that becomes really clear. Um, it becomes really clear. So that's I don't know. I'm not I'm not articulating well what's going on in my brain. I don't know, Rachel, if you want to add anything to that. <laughs> but othering. Jesus. Yeah. No, I agree. It really, I think it just set a very clear uh, distinction, um, a, a further distinction between the um, the roles and the and the freedom versus total not <laughs> no freedom, um, the prisoner versus the controller. Um, I think that I, for, I thought that it really um, was very effective in that way to sort of separate those two. Thank you. I know that was a big question to ask with just um, minutes to go and just uplifting. I love the answer of looking at the historical context since Carrie had brought into the space that tension between historical fiction and the fiction and the history of 
the gendered perceptions and how the Nazis themselves gendered people, cultures, and art, regardless of how the individuals and cultures would have gendered themselves collectively. Um, we are at time. We do have to shift over. We didn't build a buffer in. So the next section is starting right at 445. Um, it is a performance by our friends at Gorilla Opera. The Zoom link is here. Um, so we're going to shift gears. You can connect with the folks at Theater Kapow via their information on Whova. Please feel free to add any supplemental materials you didn't feel you had a chance for. I am speed talking right now, so my apologies to Sherry and everyone who is handling captions. Um, I will see you all in like 90 seconds in the next Zoom room. Thank, thank you, you thank you. Thank you, Theater Kapow. Thank you.